Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today we have a Norlin era oddity. This is called the XR2. But to fully understand this one, we kind of have to do a little bit of history. Okay, so think Les Paul Studio when you think XR series, because this was the last precursor to the studio before the studio finally was released in 1983. So these XR series guitars are historically significant in that aspect. However, they're not necessarily desirable by players or anything. They're just kind of a piece of history. So let's talk about them. First off, XR, what on earth does that stand for? It seems the most commonly accepted answer is extended range. Why do they call them extended range? Well, these models featured a coil split switch on them. That's what this little thing is right here. No, it was not added after the factory. So the extended range refers to the extended range of tones. So the XR1 has to be the most well-known and popular one, especially if you're a Def Leppard Steve Clark fan, because he's famously used XR1. They have a carved maple top to them. They've got the mahogany body, still have the maple neck, but the thing to remember about those ones is they have stock dirty fingers pickups with a coil split. If you want to learn a little bit more about that one, definitely check out my review. That guitar was fantastic, but ridiculously heavy. And now we'll skip to the XR3. It's basically the XR1 again, except for they did away with the coil split switch. So why is it still called extended range? I don't know, because those ones got Tim Shaw PAFs. So maybe they just thought, hey, it's a premium pickup in this model. But then there's the XR2. There's not a lot of information out there about these, and odds are you've never even heard of this model unless you happen to catch my XR1 episode. This instrument is nothing like the 1 or the 3. This is a blend of a Les Paul Special, so it's got a slightly reduced body width, and like a Firebird or a Les Paul Deluxe. And I say Firebird because these have mini humbucker pickups in them, right? but you don't have the exposed pole pieces, so they kind of look more Firebird-esque. But on top of that, these guys have a coil split switch. Tell me, when have you ever seen a Gibson with mini humbuckers have a stock coil split? <laughs> you just don't. These pickups are really punchy sounding. They ohm out about double of what a normal PAF is. So that's kind of how this is a Les Paul Deluxe, but it's a special because it's got a flat top on it. The one and three have a carved top. This one's flat, but they usually have some pretty beautiful figuring. This almost looks to me anyways, like a one piece maple top. I don't know, do you guys see a seam anywhere? I've been trying to find it. I did not find one though but it is paired on a three-piece mahogany back here. We'll talk about the back plate cover here in a little bit, and you have a maple neck on this one as well. Another interesting feature for this is, despite the body having binding, which is another deluxe feature, the neck does not. So that's kind of how they save some money here, as well as giving it dot inlays. So it's kind of a quirky guitar, but I've got to say, I dig it. It's not necessarily something I would suggest paying a premium for just because you need a guitar that's great to play. This is more so one for a collector that just wants something interesting as well as a piece of Gibson history. So let's go ahead, throw this one on the workbench and we will take a look at its individual parts. Let's first take a look at this. The instrument has a slightly smoky odor to it. It's nothing overpowering, but you can see how it's discolored the plastics. Originally, it was kind of a lighter color and it's turned darker. I mean, you can see that along the binding of the body as well. But what's kind of cool about when it yellows is it kind of enhances the look of the tobacco sunburst top because, well, now you've got real tobacco on it. But the pickups themselves, they've got the Tim Shaw date stamps to 1982, but you can see it's four conductor wiring because once again we have this coil split switch here. Inside the cavity route you can see you have the mounting plate, so that means you could easily put a P90 in here if you wanted to. 
and these are there from the factory. When as far as the bridge pickup goes, we've got like the exact same thing going on. Now what's kind of cool here is this has the shortly lived top adjust bridge. They call it the three point adjustment bridge. So what you've got going on here, in case you haven't seen any of my other videos, these things shipped with both brass and nylon saddles. So you can find them with both. This one has brass. But instead of adjusting the intonation from the sides, you did it from the top and the back side of these, once again, the three points. So what that means for you is if you can't quite get this string to intonate right, you need to move it up a little bit you can do that. But this portion of the bridge stays the same. And you've got nine positions in total from lower, lower, to upper, upper, to middle, middle, to lower, upper, and uh, upper, lower. You get the idea. Most people just stick them in the traditional way, but you can make them look pretty funky like that. The tailpiece on this one, I'm thinking it's been replaced. I mean, it looks close to what it should be, but something just makes me go, mm, nope. Another interesting feature here for the XR2 is it gets Les Paul reissue knobs. These are the same knobs you'll see on like the Spotlight Specials and the prehistoric reissues. So it's kind of cool to see these things on here. These are my absolute favorite knob that Gibson has ever made. Whenever I see a set for sale, I always pick them up. They've got this really cool UFO shape to them because they have the skirt right here and you can kind of tell they're kind of metallic-y. They kind of have a little bit of a sparkle to them. And the other reissue knobs of this similar style, they're just nowhere near as cool as these. This is my vintage parch drawer, by the way. Spec-wise, again, you've got the flame maple top. You've got binding on the body and the mahogany body with the maple neck and the rosewood fretboard. This one's in pretty good shape. It doesn't seem to have been played too much. You've got some impressions on the rosewood board, but eh, nothing too crazy. I like these dot inlays, and notice there is no binding along the neck, which is kind of an interesting choice since they bound the body but left this go. The truss rod cover simply reads XR2, and this is what it looks like under there. This truss rod is in good shape. You've got the Les Paul model silk screen and just a silk screen Gibson logo. We have a pretty standard 1.69 inch nut width, which increases to 2.02 .02 at the 12th. First fret neck depth of 0.84, which then increases to one inch at the 12th. Scale lengthwise, it's the traditional 24 and three quarters inches. As far as pickup readings go, the bridge one is reading 1392, and it is a coil split switch, which will bring it down to 7.18. Neck pickup when it's split a little less hot at 702, and in normal position, it is a 1374. The middle position might sound pretty interesting. We've got a 6.91 in full mode, and then it cuts all the way down to 3.55. The last unique feature here is the diamond posi lock strap buttons. Again, another shortly lived 80s part. The back is pretty interesting here. It looks like three pieces of mahogany, but there's some really nice wood grain in this one and a little bit of flame even. But let's take a look inside the control cavity here. If somebody just sent me a picture of this and asked me, is this original or not? I probably would have told them, no, that's been modified. But apparently that's what the XR2s look like because this is completely factory stock here. They just cut out that little tin spot right there and put the mini toggle in there. That's usually what you see for a modification, but it is factory. The only thing that looks like it's been replaced to me is the output jack because I don't believe Gibson ever used wires that looked like that. But we have late 1981 pots in here. And the back control plate for the toggle switch is a little bit interesting. I've briefly gone over this before, but in case you've missed it, um, the reason why this has this elongated shape is because they use the SGL style toggle switch. And why did they do that on a Les Paul? It's because this is a Les Paul special. It's slightly thinner than a regular Les Paul. My calipers read 1.75 inches. That includes the top. This is the standard looking one you'll normally find in a Les Paul. So if we line this up to where it would be, you can see that would just slightly be too tall right there. So that's why they went for this style, which leaves you with kind of a weird looking back plate. To match your three piece body, it appears you have a three piece maple neck on this one. It's kind of been stained a brown color, so it's not overly apparent that it's maple, but it definitely is. And your Gibson branded tuners here with your serial number dating this one to a fairly early 1982. 
This example weighs 8 pounds, 7.1 ounces. All right, let's go through the tones here. If this is in the up position, it's the full mode. Split is down. So we'll start on the neck pickup. Split. Middle position full. Split. Bridge position full. Split. So it's what you would expect. You get a full sound, then a split sound, but these pickups are really punchy. That really overdrives your amp, even on the clean setting, so it's kind of nice to be able to clean those up a bit. So I really like the clean tones out of this thing. But unfortunately, these pickups are ridiculously microphonic. So you're gonna get a lot of squealing whenever you have any type of distortion with them. The key to these pickups is to keep picking, don't stop. <laughs>
enjoyed learning about this instrument and getting to hear how it sounds. This instrument was sent in by a fan of the show. He wanted me to verify its originality and authenticity. Because he's not in the States right now, he wanted a trained eye to look at this since he's in the military at this time. So for him, I'm going to document the condition. This instrument, it's in cared for condition, but there is a smoke odor to it. It's not overwhelming, but it's definitely ever present. Your hands will smell a little bit. So face of the headstock, you've got some light scratches. I think the most noticeable one is right here. There's kind of like an impression or a ding right there. Truss rod works just fine. Neck is straight, so no issues there. The frets on this instrument are in very good shape, very minimal wear. I'm not going to say they're 100% perfect. You can definitely tell they've been leveled, recrowned, and dressed. I, I'm not sure how long ago, but you can kind of see up here, if I get it in the light just right, there's some tooling marks on the board up here, mainly right here where somebody's fret file slipped a little bit. Top of the instrument, it's got lots of scratches. I mean, mainly just picking wear, something that a scratch remover would definitely get out. However, you do have two very tiny finish checks right here, kind of like right there and there. You kind of have to get them in the light just right to see them, but it's definitely important to note they are there. And this one's got a pretty nice top to it. I like that. It's not quite as good as the best one I've ever seen, but it's definitely a nice example. The chrome hardware does have pitting on it. You can kind of see that on the pickup covers. They're not 100% perfect, but in good shape. Back of the headstock serial number, it looks like 80962515, made in USA. There is a very small ding right here at the top of the corner. But other than that, the sides and the tops of the headstock are in pretty good shape. You do have a stand impression mark. It kind of looks like a ding. It's not necessarily like the usual nitro burn. It's just kind of an impression onto the finish that kind of dinged the wood a little bit. No volute, because this is a 1982. That's the year the volute disappeared. So that's kind of an interesting factoid right there. You've got a nice slim 60s neck profile on this one, I would say, but it definitely kind of chunks up once you get up to the heel. Something to definitely know about this is there are impressions on the back of the neck right here, probably from like a capo or something. It's always important to mention these because there's a lot of players that are very particular about not having dings on the back of the neck. That can be a deal breaker for many people. Now take a look at this back, beautiful, right? But we do have some major impressions right here. They kind of scuff up the finish. You've got some right here. And there's also a few dings right here, kind of by the heel. Now the heel's not compromised by any means, but you should definitely know about those. I don't necessarily see any like huge buckle worming areas, but you've got some light wear. So it was taken care of, but I mean, it's definitely got some wear here. The sides of the instrument, kind of the same thing going on here. You've got light nicks and dings pretty much all around here. Looks like some stand marks down here. And everything else is looking pretty good here. So it's been played, but you definitely have some wear on it. Honestly, the worst thing about this guitar are the super microphonic pickups. I mean, they're not just slightly microphonic. They're, these are devils. They squeal and they hurt your ears as soon as you hit any type of boost. But everything's looking good finish-wise here. Your knobs are also glowing if you get them in the light just right. Beautiful top here. Take a look at the back. Everything's looking good here. Quick run around the sides as well. This one, the, the smokiness of it has definitely aged the lacquer on this tobacco sunburst finish. So I would say this one definitely passes the black light test here. This instrument does retain Gibson Generation 3 chainsaw case. The Gibson badge is missing but all three latches are present and functioning, which is the most important thing here. And the interior is a nice blue color. It definitely complements the tobacco sunburst finish. I like these cases, they're just bulky. It's hard to store large collections in these things. 
Some of the interiors kind of falling down. A little bit of hot glue takes care of that real quick though. I guess now that I look at it, this might not be the original case because you can kind of see there's another impression of a knob right here, which means something else was probably in this case. But the main impression is the XR2 with those mini humbuckers. If you think you might be interested in owning a Gibson XR2, I'll put some links in the description that will take you to some other ones that are for sale at this point in time. There's usually not that many of these that come up for sale, and when they do, they kinda sell fast because there's a little bit of a collector following for these oddities. Thank you Troglodytes for watching, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.